The Spiderwick Chronicles was a huge nostalgic hit in the 2000s, and seeing it return to the screen after such a long time has fans ecstatic. The anticipation is huge at this point, and the actors becoming a part of this live-action movie include Joy Bryant. What character is she playing in this? Well, let's find out. What character is Joy Bryant playing in the upcoming movie? The newest star to join the newest live-action series of The Spiderwick Chronicles, produced by Disney+, Plus, has been announced, and fans are loving it. Joy Bryant will be portraying the character of Helen Grace, who we know to be the smart, loving, and strong mother of three teenagers. The Spiderwick Chronicles is a book series adaptation revolving around the Grace family, which has twin brothers Jared and Simon, their sister Mallory, and their mother Helen. As they move into their shabby ancestral home and begin to unravel a dark mystery about their great-great-uncle, who once discovered the secret and maybe foreboding fairy world existing in parallel to their own, Joy Bryant, who will be playing Helen, uproots her family from their home in Brooklyn to her grandfather, Arthur Spiderwick's estate in Michigan. She's doing everything she can to provide for her family even in the wake of her divorce. Not only that, she's also trying to help her son Jared resolve his mental health issues. Bryant will be in the show along with Lion Daniels, Noah Cottrell, and Christian Slater, who were already cast. So what is this legacy based on? Well, the movie was based on a series of children's books that were indeed read and devoured back in the day. Considering their apparent popularity, it was adapted into a film. Some fans said that the books are vastly superior to the movie, but doesn't that happen with every film based on a book? So, it's alright. The film stars the former child actor turned adult Freddie Highmore. This is one of those actors who will forever be seen in movies from the 2000s era and will be remembered for that. It is evident that the Spiderwick Chronicles fall into the misguided fad of children's fantasy which attempted to cash in on the success of Harry Potter and the Chronicles of Narnia. The first misstep was using the word Chronicles in the title as it doesn't appear to refer to anything. If the fast pace and bouncy CGI aren't enough to distract you from the plot, there's also some trick photography gimmickry of the lead actor, August Rush, playing both himself and his twin brother. Of course, in the future, they can just grow a temporary twin brother in the lab. But here, they had to resort to digital compositing and split screen but most of the time it's just a body double who doesn't look like the character at all, so he hides his face in every shot. How is Nickelodeon connected to Spiderwick Chronicles? The book in the film is more of a diary of a field guide, but really it was just MacGuffin, and the overall story of the film is just a briskly paced fairy tale. There is an appearance by Nick Nolte who plays an old dirty man who lives in a cave and mistakes a couple of kids for lunch, essentially playing himself, and of course there's all the dated CG which was good for its time, but aren't we all glad we're just growing these things in a lab now? An additional piece of historical trivia about the film that many people might not know is that this is a product of Nickelodeon movies. Interesting, right? Nickelodeon for some reason went through this period where they tried to make a bunch of live-action content. They based a series of unfortunate events on Charlotte's Web, Nacho Libra, and then Spiderwick Chronicles. The sad part is that these movies just sort of faded away because people thought thought of them as inherently bad movies at the time. Was it just extremely forgettable to the point where nobody ever bothered to revisit it? Well, yes, it did have a hard time competing against other movies from the same year. How many parts is Disney planning to make? A brief premise of what happened in the last movie is that a kid named Jared, his brother Simon, his sister Mallory, and his divorced mom are fighting off monsters to protect a book about fairies. The writer of this book passed away way before, and therefore it was their duty to protect it from those creatures. There's an established expectation that this new upcoming movie will be dragged out into at least three really long movie parts, and fans are saying that these parts will be progressively worse than the last one because that's how it's always been with adaptations. It's like an unspoken rule at this point because the cycle has repeated. Whenever filmmakers try adapting a series of books, especially books centered around fantasy with all kinds of fictional creatures, including magic, it doesn't end well. But who knows, Disney might kick it up a notch and add variety into the cinematic universe by dabbling into different forms of media. The Spiderwick Chronicles probably has the most concise pacing for a film like this. Why? Because there are five books, which are all being made into movies with a duration of at least an hour and a half. The fun part is that you really don't realize how much you've watched until the film's finally over, and that's what nostalgia is all about. So what kind of creatures will be playing the villains? 
There's rarely any confusion as to how the story's unique rules surrounding the creatures work. Everything is wrapped up with a nice little bow and you walk out of the film saying, damn, I totally understand what I just experienced. You feel pretty satisfied. Not a lot of movies are really able to do that nowadays. Let's move on to the monsters of the movie who are playing the antagonists. Well, that's literally the main focus of the story, so why not get into the details then? There are goblins, ghouls, trolls, and old men. There are so many fantastic little creatures ranging from cute as a button to holy Jesus killing it with fire immediately. Many fans pick their favorite creature as the movie's main antagonist. The ogre, who is capable of shape-shifting, has everyone in all. It has the ability to turn into a human, a snake, a crow, a nickno, and then, of course, his default ogre form. Fans have learned from cinema and children's stories that ogres are actually pretty cool dudes, nothing too scary or disturbing for the most part. I mean, take Shrek. You really think Shrek could go wrong? Not a chance. To be honest, there is a nice set of nightmares for you on this ride. Take a moment of silence for all the kids from 2008 that had to see that ogre's face on the big screen. Fans are not looking forward to the unnecessary emotional drama, but why? Although this action-filled movie has a lot of joyful moments, fans have also pointed out cringe based on second-hand embarrassment. The movie is flooded with heavy-handed family drama. There are so many scenes dealing with Jared's parents being divorced and his deadbeat dad abandoning his kids. Jared himself acts like an edgelord, making his mom cry sometimes, and it's not a fun watch. This is an emotional drama about an unstable domestic relationship in the same movie where Seth Rogen plays a pig monster who eats birds. It doesn't really add up. Of course, having a subplot where a little boy who hates his mom and gets into arguments with his sister is all right because those are all just common traps. But it just doesn't connect that one minute the three kids are fighting for survival against a gang of goblin demons and then the next minute Charlie is crying because daddy won't call him on his flip phone. Basically, the little boy wanted his dad to tell him that he did a good job of finding the golden ticket. It could be done better in the upcoming Disney Plus adaptation as the previous movie has a lot of emotional themes going on in the first place. What are the expectations from this movie? Because of the book, fans who were kids back then really enjoyed this movie as kids and have nostalgia attached to it. The world building in it from one film is phenomenal and the effects and character designs are solid too. Also, it's legitimately scary for quite a bit of the runtime, which you don't usually see in a kid's movie. And Freddie Highmore plays two roles and does both really well. After watching this, at like age 9 or 10, kids back then actually started believing in fairies. In this future era of real special effects, some people will look back at a time when our only means of conveying mystical little creatures was by a computer-generated animation composited into live photography. Even though no matter how much effort was put into it, the lightning would never quite match and the live actors would always be looking through these things like they weren't really there. The two most commendable things about this franchise are, first, the sheer gruesome horror packed into a PG-rated family film in the Home Invasion third act. Second, the way all of the thrills and creatures and scares are firmly grounded in the family drama of a little boy with an absent father and a single mother. Fans really miss the Freddy Highmore era. That's why they love it as well, as well as David Strathairn. The man is a legend, plain and simple, and everyone anticipating a lot from the new Disney adaptation. Hey, let us know in the comments if you're excited as everyone else to watch this spectacular piece of nostalgia.